Right now, there are 109 billion reasons why Latinos are not buying products because they're not represented, their ads aren't speaking to them, or the products, they're not what we want. They're not listening to us. Historically, there's been a problem in the Hispanic market space. Whether you're talking about Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, Black, Asian, whatever, it's always been undervalued. You're talking about 20% of the population, 51% of this country's growth. All voices matter when you're creating products, services, content, advertising for a diverse, multicultural, intersectional audience, which is the American audience today. The definitions are changing. How does it impact me and what are my feelings about it? Ads aren't gonna resonate just because you put a big Latino or Latinx or Hispanic word across it. It's not about the word, it's what is the creative. What is the messaging? I just want to put it out there to the <laughs> listeners that I am recently single. Hey! And I'm ready to mingle. Okay. okay. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Banking on Cultura. I am your host, Victoria Jen Rodriguez. And today I got two kick ass powerhouse Latinas Jacqueline Hernandez, who is the CEO of the new Majority Ready, a value creation marketing consulting firm focused on helping companies reach and engage with both multicultural and youth consumers. So thank Gen Z and millennials, y'all. She is the former president of Combate Americas, the leading Hispanic MMA sports franchise. She also previously held the roles of chief marketing officer for NBC Universal Hispanic Enterprises and was the chief operating officer of Telemundo, overseeing upwards of $750 million in revenue and had oversight of 600 employees. If you're thinking one of badass, you're right. I'm also joined by mi amiga Adriana Waterson, who is the executive vice president and insights and strategy lead at Hurwitz Research, a premier consumer insights and market research company. Adriana is a research junkie with a flair for finding the story behind the statistics. She consults companies across industries, including media and entertainment, tech, beauty, CPG, toys, and even the emerging cannabis market. She focuses on bringing those companies closer to consumer segments such as Latinx, Black, Asian, LGBTQIA+, Gen Z kids, and those with disabilities. She was named one of the most influential minorities in cable by Cable Fox Magazine and is frequently quoted by the press given her expertise. So yes, another badass is present, y'all. So both of these ladies have vast experience for the topic that we're going to discuss today. And we're essentially going to break down what's happening in the advertising industry as it relates to our community. How are they spending money? How are they not spending money? So that you can understand if you are a business owner or if you're creative or if you are in corporate, how do you actually engage with Latinos? We need to get this all the way together because they don't know what to do with us, y'all. They don't know what to do with us. So Jackie, Adriana, welcome to Vinky on Cultura. Thank you. We're so excited to be here, right? <laughs> Thank you for having us on this 35th Hispanic Heritage Month. Thank I you know. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> so let's talk about how we got here. So, yeah. Adriana, you and I met at the T. Howard Foundation we did. dinner. Yeah. Do you want to share the story of how it went down? Well, I saw you across the room and knew you were somebody. <laughs> if I didn't know you already, I needed to know you. Okay. And I just, I remember seeing you across the room and zigzagging right over to where you were and connecting. There and must been... have been a fashion connection in here because both of you are so fashionista. There was a little bit of a connection. There was. You had this jacket on that was like studded out to perfection. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely gorgeous. And shout out to my boy, Christian Ortega, who allowed me to join him at his table that uh -huh. evening. That's why I was there. But you just had this energy to you yeah. and this like amazingness and I was like I need to learn more about this woman but then it got really interesting because yeah. we started having a conversation about data mm -hmm. around advertisers and how they are spending money on the Latino community and I was like you know what we need to bring this to the banking acultura right. community because this is the type of information that a lot of us are not privy to and yeah. we really don't understand the politics, the dynamics between where ad dollars go and how exactly we're marketed to, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Mm -hmm. So let's get into some bonchinche because you know we like okay. to open up the show <laughs> with some bonchinche. bonchinche. So who wants to go first giving us some bonchinche? You have some really good one and it's fresh. Okay. <laughs> All right, I have two things. Let's go. Okay, so the first thing is you know, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, just came out of the Hispanic TV Summit, and I'm super excited because my company, slash I, 
won an award called the Rafael Eli Pioneer in Hispanic Television Award. Wow. Rafael was a very dear friend who unfortunately passed during COVID. And so this award means a lot, not just because of the work that my company and I have done and to be honored for it, but also because uh, being honored in his name. So that's wonderful. And then the other is a little bit more on the personal side. Yes. You know, I like the personal Um, (laughs) So I just want to put it out there to the (laughs) listeners that I am recently single. And ready to mingle? Ready to mingle. Okay. But I've only got a couple of requirements. So just to let it all out there. (laughs) Eh, Prefiero que sea un hombre latino. Okay. Divorciado. Okay. With adult children. Okay. Y que tenga una lancha en Puerto Rico. Ooh. Mm. Okay. So any takers. Okay. You know how to reach me. LinkedIn, Banking on cultura, Facebook, where you fall Porta. in love. I you love it. You officially put it out there. I, it's out there. <laughs> yes, God yeah. is going to take care of it now because it's out there. I'm manifesting. Yes, I love it. Jackie, <laughs> so won't change it? not as good as that, except I'm almost recently single. Not really. I'm oh, very God. happily married, but okay. we are about to go on our vacation to the Azores. But what's mm. important about this is it's a redo. <laughs> okay. We were supposed to go a year ago. One of us, four days before we were leaving, realized their passport wasn't updated. No mm. way. It I'm wasn't in the process me. of that it right now. It was someone <laughs> else. And I, remember also, we had three years of COVID, no traveling to Europe. Like, no traveling. This was like the vacation of vacations. So I have to say, I was super cool. I was oh like, okay, esto me podría pasar a mí. Like, I need to be cool about it. So we are doing the redo. He booked the whole thing over again. And I'm just oh. so excited after four years of not being able to travel. So to is Europe. that what saved the marriage? He got it together? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But I have to say, I love him to death. I I do have to say, for those of you who don't know, Jackie is married to an equally amazing. Her partner is Jack Rico. Yes, and he is super cool. A blogger in his own right. He has a a media show. Yep, and it's brown and black. Okay, he does podcast and interviews and he's fabulous colombiano okay de Barranquilla. Okay. Mm-hmm. yeah he's awesome so I, <laughs> I i appreciate that jackie's giving him a pass on the <laughs> on the passport fiasco <laughs> he deserves it okay. i love it i love it okay so let's get into some data because yeah. both of you have tremendous insight in this space so can you tell us how advertisers are actually viewing the latino community because they're treating us almost like a monolith, right? And can you share some of like the history, where we are right now, and aspiration for the future? Jackie and I have known each other for many years, so I know we think alike. <laughs> so I'll start. I can yep. start, but just chime in. So, and, and actually, Jackie is even more of an expert in this because uh, you know she was the GM of Telemundo. I mean, you know, her whole thing was about explaining to advertisers the value of the Hispanic market. From a researcher's perspective, I can tell you that, you know, what I've, so I'm a little bit of a step outside. I don't buy or sell media, but I just do research on consumers and I help advise my clients, which are mostly either the media companies on the one hand or the advertisers on the other of what, you know, what has to happen. And historically, there's been a, a problem, right, in the Hispanic, in the Hispanic market space, which is that, first of all, multicultural, whether you're talking about Hispan, Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, Black, Asian, whatever. I'm sure we'll get into that. <laughs> all that we'll get into in a second. But it's always been undervalued, right? Advertising budgets are gigantic. And then multicultural markets budgets are this size. And then within that, you know, the Hispanic market or the Latinx market. So that's been the problem that Hispanic media has had to contend with forever and ever and ever, right? You know, the Latino space, the Latinx space has been a a little bit more privileged than some of the other groups because there was a real voice. The Hispanic market, you know, there's a lot of advertising agencies we had, and now it's called something else, but AHA, which was the association, yeah, and whoever they are now, I don't even know, the the cultural, whatever, importa, pero the Hispanic ad agencies work together to really create the market, to educate the market, the networks, you know, Telemundo and Univision really help to define the market. So historically in the past, you know, within the multicultural budget, a Hispanic got its fair share. You know, post everything that went on in 2020, I think there was a shift. There was a growth in understanding about multiculturalism in general and the importance of reaching and serving diverse voices with a shift towards, I think, prioritizing the black audience, which, by the way, I think is 
totally, I mean, they were undervalued and underrepresented for a long time. So, right. you know, the, I'll say so, the evening out, the ba- you know, rebalancing was fine. The problem is where we are right now, which is that after the hype around, uh, you know, BLM and the murder of George Floyd and, uh, you know, y- you now see all of the news is this company cut their DE&I, this other company cut their multicultural budget. Like we're almost going back to where we were before. It's like we take 10 steps forward and then, you know, 12 steps back. Right. That's my yeah. view anyway. Yeah. So let's take that view. Everything you said, I totally agree. But let's also take it to like a little bit of the future and mm-hmm. also the facts. So you asked about data. So there are many companies that do lean in and they do lean in well and they don't do it just monolithically, although there are those that have that problem. But you're talking about a market that's over, is it going to exceed $2.5 trillion. Mm-hmm. You're talking about 20% of the population, 51% of this country's growth, mm-hmm. also growing at twice the speed of the general population. Mm-hmm. That is all going to change. The underrepresentation and disproportionate amounts of dollars, that is going to change because of two reasons. One, the consumer. Mm-hmm. The consumer, the Latino consumer, especially the Gen, X, the Gen Z and the millennials, they're not going to go with brands that are not aligned with their values. Mm-hmm. They're going to say no, or mm-hmm. they'll cancel them. The second thing is the rise of multiracial. Mm-hmm. This whole thing about, you know, this box or that box or the other, it's not a consideration. Right. In the last census, it was striking. 18 to 44-year-olds, it was 300% growth in multiracial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to start seeing a lot more ads. Like my, one of my favorite was the NFL ad during the Super Bowl. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was Diana Flores. She's this famous Mexican football flag racer. And she was running through and it it had very inclusive people of all different races and ethnicities were in the ad. At one point, it's bilingual, está hablando con su mamá en español. And at the end, it's all about women moving football Mm -hmm. forward. So everyone related. It's about women and women moving this sport forward. But it was that is what we're going to need to see more in the future instead of just these boxes. And one more thing, I think this whole like meet Hispanic media, the days of just buying linear two networks for reaching Mm -hmm. Latinos, that's done. It's now, where do you see them? You see them on YouTube, social media, Mm -hmm. TikTok, even streaming platforms like uh, VIX, you know, ad supported streaming. So that is what's changed. It's not formulaic anymore. And anyone who treats it monolithically is just wasting their money, in my opinion. Yeah. When do you foresee that change happening? We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate, especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. Okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. Turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount, and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Check out www.victoriagen.com slash training to learn my three-step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season okay so tap in and i'll see you inside the training let's go there was a lot of data supporting dni efforts and still those are the first budgets to be cut right mm-hmm. there's a lot of data supporting the reason why advertisers companies need to invest in people of color but it's just taking so long even though the data supports it. So even with this data, like, what do you foresee happening? When, when? Is it 2050? (laughs) Is it 2060? Like, when are we going to see the shift? Uh, I'm not going to give you the when. I'll give you the why. I recently saw a report that McKinsey did, 
And currently, right now, there are 109 billion reasons why, and those are $109 billion, that Latinos are not buying products because they're not represented, their ads aren't speaking to them, or the products Mm -hmm. just don't, they're not Mm -hmm. what we want. They're Mm -hmm. not listening to us. As those dollars keep growing, as we keep growing, businesses are going to be like, wait, money speaks. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. It's about following the money. I think I think one of the struggles in the past is that, you know, the, a lot of the sort of people that were talking about this longer term strategy were looking towards the future. But the future is coming up upon us now, right? So we talked about when is the United States going to be a multicultural majority? Well, in many of our major urban cities, we already are a multicultural majority. When you look at the millennial generations and younger, all these younger generations are multicultural majority generations. And including, like like Jackie was saying, these folks that have not just these you know, very siloed identities, but who are, who have very intersectional identities, whether it's, you know, I'm Afro-Latina and LGBTQ or, you know, whatever the case may be. So the practice of reaching and serving these audiences is going to become a lot more art than science in a sense, and is going to require some real skill, of course, backed by research. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So what would you advise, let's say there's an advertiser who wants to tap into this market. They have a $50 million budget. What are the top mm. three things you would recommend them to do? Well, I'm going to start to say, I'm going to, of course, Get the start research. with research. Get Hire the, the research, research done. <laughs> there's a lot of research you could do with a $50 million budget. No, but serious, I think research, I mean, and I'm, again, I know it's what I do for work, but the reality is the research is, to me, the underpinning of so much of what happens. It informs product development. It informs, you know, branding and positioning, right? It informs understanding, you know, who your audience is, doing audience segmentation, who's the target for this product and what is their, you know, what's the psychology of that particular audience. And then of course, all the tactical research that goes into executing whatever it is you need to execute, whether it's creative testing, whether it's packaging research, whether it's, you know, all of those kinds of things. So I do fundamentally believe that Every successful brand in the United States, whether it's they're targeting the Latinx market or any other market, is a brand that has a fundamental understanding of the role of research. I think a lot of times what happens is that research is viewed as an expense as rather uh, instead of an investment. Mm. And that is a, you know, and maybe it's the, you know, finance bros that that look at it as a, you know, a, a, a negative instead of a, a positive on the balance sheet. But the positive impact of really investing in research can't be understated, in my opinion. And one of the reasons we bonded throughout all these years, ever since we first met, is I believe in research firmly. But even more now, there was a time when advertising pushed out messages and we, you know, we would buy it because they marketed it. Mm -hmm. But now if the product doesn't fit or we don't like the feel or the company doesn't stand what I stand for, like really understanding that is more important than ever. Yeah. So now the consumer is pulling and not being pushed at. Mm-hmm. And if you don't speak to them and you don't understand what they want, you're not going to be effective. So I think that investing the money is great. But first, either understanding the consumer or hiring people like Adriana who understand the consumer. Because a lot of these companies freeze. They're like, I don't really know what to do. Mm-hmm. So I won't do it which has been a big problem. And I'm like, hire someone or learn it. If you're in marketing, you should know the Latin market, whether you're Latin or not. Or they'll give the money to the Mexican community and be like, oh, we got it covered. Yeah, check. Check. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so research, understanding the consumer psychology, right, of the Latino community. What would be the third thing? Where should they put that money? Well, I'm going to say that investing in talent in your organization. And I know this sounds very pithy. Everybody says it, you know, and that's why everybody did like, got to hire a DEI person. But it, it, it's not about decorating your, you know, website with the images of diverse CEOs. That's not what it's for. The idea of bringing diverse people into your organization is to make sure that there are diverse voices participating in decision making at all steps of the process. Mm-hmm. It's not to say that, you know, only Latinx voices matter. It's to say all voices matter when you're creating products, services, content, advertising, whatever it is, for a diverse, multicultural, intersectional 
audience, which is the American audience today, then you need all those voices, you know, sitting around the table to make those decisions. So it's, a, it's again, a, you know, a, a critical investment nowadays. And by the way, part of the problem with that is that in many of the uh, different sort of workflows within a corporation or a company, there isn't necessarily a good pipeline to develop that talent, right? And so I think it's really important for companies to really think outside of the box of how you start developing a pipeline for that diverse talent. Of course, we're on the heels of uh, of a recent Supreme Court decision that ended affirmative action. Mm -hmm. And I see that as inherently short-sighted yeah. for the future of corporate America and for, you know, for the state of our economy. Because if we're going to be blind to the fact that systemic inequities exist, mm -hmm. whether it's for black folks or for Latinx folks or whoever, and we don't make an effort to even out those systemic inequities and to, you know, allow for the development of multicultural talent at the corporate level, we're going to lose out. Yeah, I agree with that. I also think that marketers need to really think about purpose right now, mm -hmm. not just selling their products. Like, what meaning does it have? What are they doing? How are they connecting, especially with the Latino community? We want to know that they really see us, hear us, and they understand the nuances and what's important. And they make stands. So I think that's also very important, incredibly important right now. Oh, I so I can I just yeah, piggyback sure, on course. that? I think that's so true, Jackie. You know, 20 years from ago or 15 years ago, that wasn't an issue, right? We didn't have the internet. You know, corporate America could exist in their ivory towers and, you know, the, the decision makers could be all whatever white old men and they could be donating money to this cause or that cause and, you know, having all these, you know, corporate practices that were, you know, whatever, unethical or not aligned with the way that their consumer, you know, would mm -hmm. think. That... That's over. That is over. There is no The consumer secrecy. really cares now and, and they, knows. They care and they can find out. It's kind of like all those TikToks where it's like, you know, mm -hmm. blank around and find out with Gen Z. <laughs> They're going to find out. find out. Oh, can we curse on this? <laughs> yes, we can. All right, fuck around and find out. <laughs> there you go. I said it. Say it. Y, pero eso es así. Eso es así yeah. con la juventud de hoy. Yep. Y, and you can't be like somebody that's, the, the, you know... Uh, Using Pride as an example, putting rainbows out on your pride, during Pride Month and then going and donating to politicians that Not are enacting anti-LGBT right. legislation. Like, no. you just can't do that in, right. or in today's world. Right. Yep. Y hablando del Hispanic market también. O sea, you're not going to go and say that, you know, you want to cater to the, the Latino population and then go and fund, you know, politicians who are anti-immigration, who are anti- We know, know they- Companies want to sell their products. Now we need to believe that we want to buy it because we buy into what That's they right. do. Mm. Mm. So I wonder if that is specific to the Latino community or just overall consumer psychology, given everything that we've just gone through over the last Every, four I years. I think it's a generational. It's a new generation that's looking for transparency and for truth. With the Latino community, I think it's just being marginalized or not being seen and now mm. really wanting to be seen and heard because of the economic power. But I think it's generational and I think it's here to change. We're all starting to see it. Yeah. So let's talk about how advertisers, I've heard through the grapevine, you guys are more in this space than me, consider Latinos to be part of the mainstream. So they're like, what's the point of us dedicating a specific budget just to Latinos when they are the majority of Americans right now. So they're in the mainstream. So how are we market to one? We market to all. What do you say to that? So I think that the ad that I gave an example of of the NFL was very much Latino, but marketing to all. But it made the Latina in the, the protagonist. Yes. Mm. And it was at the center of the spot. And we all saw it, but everyone could feel that it was inclusive. So if it was just an ad that had a message for everyone, that wouldn't have resonated. If it was just an ad that said, you know, support the NFL and women behind the NFL, great. But this stood out. Llamo la atención. You saw it. You saw it was bilingual. You saw it was inclusive and multicultural. That's where I believe marketers need to really look at and go. And when they say mainstream, that's fine. You can be mainstream. We are everywhere. Look, mm -hmm. we're Coachella. We're, you know, we're everywhere. But make it the pr the priority and the protagonist and not just a you know, message that's going to everyone. 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to – so a couple of things. 150% about that, which I'm going to go back to. But let's just actually unpack – The you started in the beginning. You asked about – um, Latinos being a mon- being treated as a monolith. So let's just unpack that for one second yeah, as part of this conversation, <laughs> right? Yeah. So so <laughs> I was just reminding Jackie <laughs> that back in 2001, when I first published, Horowitz first published our report, which still exists today called Focus Latino, which is a study of, it's an annual study that looks at the Latino market for media. And it was the first report that I know of that came out and said, Guess what? The Hispanic market is not all Spanish dominant immigrants who only watch Spanish language TV. I came out and analyzed, you know, we've got less acculturated, we've got more acculturated, we've got the bilingual biculturals, you know, these are all different segments with different behaviors around media and and content consumption, different, you know, psychographics, all these other things. So that was a problem for the Hispanic media market at the time who had banked on convincing advertisers that if you, at the time it was like 50 million Hispanics back in 2001, something like that. And if you want to reach all 50 million at the time Hispanics, you have to buy one of these two networks and you have to use one of these, whatever, 10 advertising agencies. So people didn't really like that I came out (laughs) with that information because it was a problem. But the reality is that's number one. So Mm -hmm. we've got... And we are always going to have that kind of diversity within the Latino market because, you know, right now, maybe immigration, you know, whatever is an issue. But as soon as we need laborers, there's going to be more immigration. We're going to, you know, there's always going to be people coming in. There's always going to be new generations being born. I mean, we know now at this moment that, uh, you know, the majority of of Hispanic births are U.S. births, but that could change. You know, that's always going to change. There's always going to be a very diverse market in that sense. And there's also the issue of culture, right? Yo soy Puerto Ricana, you know? Eh, No soy Mexicana. So, but you're right, you know, with the bulk of Hispanics in the U.S. being of Mexican descent, you know, the numbers would tell you, well, we should be making these choices. The reality is, though, is that, you know, that kind of prescriptive approach, it it doesn't really fly anymore because guess what? Mucha esa esa gente mexicana están casados con puertorriqueños, con colombianos, con quien sea. And we're all mixing and merging. So it's a question of really, you know, not worrying so much about being prescriptive about, oh, we're going to use well, these colors and this music and this whatever to reach that target, but rather to think about what are those universal stories that would resonate for Latinos, even for people that are not Latino, but who could, you know, resonate, whose stories could resonate similarly, you know, all that kind of stuff, which is why I agree with Jackie that really the thinking has to shift, the conversation has to shift more around how do you change mainstream marketing? Because let's face it, mainstream marketing has been code word for white marketing. Right. Mm. And it, it's not a white world anymore. It's, it's not a new a white majority. World anymore. Mm-hmm. So I don't understand the question of when people say, well, we're not going to have, you know, like all black people in this ad or all Latinos in this ad because it's a general market ad. And then you go and put all white people in it. Like, how is that? What's that? Well, that's not going to work anymore. And right. Two things that, you know, you've always been very ahead of everything. You're like a Nostradamus. You were talking about 2001. <laughs> Talk about it. In 2014, <laughs> I commissioned yep. Horowitz and Adriana led a study for all of NBCU called America Reimagined. And I think it was like a, a number like 45% of Latinos consider themselves black, brown, or mestizo. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, my God, this whole concept that all Latinos are not of color is mm-hmm. not true. And it resulted in Telemundo, which, you know, at the time the programming was very Mm novella-esque, doing its first Afro-Latino 100% cast with Celia, the little life of Celia Cruz, La La Reina del Salsa. Still gives me goosebumps because that was one of the best shows ever made. And but, but this was 2014. <laughs> this was the first right. time it ever happened. This, this is progress. This is the world yeah. we live in. I mm-hmm. mean, she's about to become on a she's going to be on a coin next mm-hmm. year, you know, like, but it's about Asuka. As, as, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's understanding, knowing the data, but then also knowing the human truths and evolving with it. The mainstream is of color. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we spoke about what advertisers need to do to tap in. What about Latinos understanding this data now? 
We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate, especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. Okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, huh, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. Turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power system? Check out www.victoriagen.com slash training to learn my three-step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go. Creatives, like how should they be positioning? How should they be building a business case for support for their projects? The power of our stories, the power of our market, I mean, it's you're starting to see it. We have an Afro Latino and Spider Man. We've got the Blue Beetle about to come out. You know, the it, we're becoming very much the leaders in pop culture. Bad Bunny. And I, Bad Bunny. I. Oh, my favorite story <laughs> there is this past summer that one the number one song on the globally on Spotify for like weeks mm -hmm. was it was like between Peso Pluma and Grupo Frontera. But the Grupo Frontera story is super interesting because that song un por tiento blew up and it's a collab with bad bunny yeah. right it's unity it's coming together it's being authentically who we are mm -hmm. and telling our stories and the power of it together yeah. and i think that's going to continue to blow up as we just continue to be loud and proud that's right mm, loud and proud i love that you know that's easy for us body you know <laughs> we'd be super loud and proud <laughs> okay so oh there's so many different directions i want to go here but I think it would be helpful for us to tap in, Jackie, when we were prepping for this conversation, you had said you kind of find yourself stuck between the gringa mm -hmm. complex and the cuchifrito complex. <laughs> so can we go towards that angle a little bit? Yeah. Because I think a lot of folks can identify with that. Yeah, so let's start with the cuchifrito complex. Growing up, you know, we were given American names. Jackie, Jacqueline, I was Jacqueline Onassis Kennedy. That's mm -hmm. what I was named after. Mm -hmm. We spoke Spanish at home, but not out of the home. Mm -hmm. And we were told to, you know, assimilate and fit in and we were going to get ahead, right? So whenever we did get ahead, if we, or if we didn't, we had that little complex, like, am I supposed to be here? And it's basically our flavor of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that was growing up. Now, flash forward to now. And it's like, oh, I feel like there's a how Hispanic are you? You know, like, what is the degree of it? And this really happened to me last year. I applied New Majority Ready for minority-owned business. And I was told, you're not a minority because your family, your parents are from Spain. And I get it. And I, But it was like, oh, my God, what about all those years yeah. <laughs> of, you know, me being Hispanic, being Hernandez, not, you know, feeling that cuchifito. Now I'm feeling the gringa thing. And there's also the whole race thing that came out right. from both Black Lives Matter and I think we saw it in our community with In the Heights. And, you know, it was our, us confronting colorism, mm -hmm. which yeah. is real, very yes. real in our community. And so all of that come together. It's like, wow, white privilege here, right? Yeah. But Hispanic upbringing from immigrants who came to this country, didn't speak English well and were blue collar and yet putting it all together and now yeah. really looking at, well, the definitions are changing. How do how does it impact me? And what are the what are my feelings about it? Because that old person's still inside me. But the new person is rationalizing the new world we live yeah. in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel yes. like I totally empathize with that story. I feel that same thing. It's 
I do a lot of qualitative research, right? And I hear from Latinos when we do, you know, when we do one-on-one work and we talk about, you know, what does it mean to be Latino in this country? How does it feel? You know, what do you... And one of the things that I hear a lot are about being underestimated, you know, being underestimated and then over-delivering, mm-hmm. which is something that's very... It's a common theme I hear. Mm-hmm. And this issue between not being Latino enough to be... I mean, I think it was Selena that said it at one point. No soy, Mexic- no soy bastante mexicana para los mexicanos ni bastante americana para los americanos. Right. Y, y eso nos pasa a todos, ¿verdad? Eh, yo me crié eh, judía cubana en Puerto Rico, nací y, y, creí, y, y me creí en Puerto Rico, ¿verdad? And I, I always feel like I was never, I wasn't Jewish enough for the Jewish people. I wasn't cubana white enough for, for the, the white, cubanos. Right. Mm-hmm. I wasn't Puerto Rican enough for the Puerto Ricans. And when I came to the States, people were like, you're from like some, like you're, who are you, you know? Eres gringa. Y, 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 ajá. White facing. Y, y entonces, pero en mi, en mi carrera profesional, mi experiencia fue algo bien diferente. Porque I started, like, let's, I joined, I started doing this work in, in 2001, as I mentioned, 2000, 2001. And at the time, there were very few Latinos in positions of power in the companies that I was working with. Mm-hmm. And... I felt like my white Latinaness made it very made my message much more palatable for the could, people. You were translatable because I was like representing the Latino voice, but I wasn't intimidating because I, you know, didn't look, I, I, I didn't, I didn't look as Latino <laughs> as they imagined Latinos right. would look like, right? Mm-hmm. So and it was a superpower then. It is it now? It, it's well, you know. I think it's interesting. I think to your point about the, the the race issue, and rightly so. I mean, I think that the Latino market we have a problem with colorism. We have it in Puerto Rico. You know, I I don't know about this last census, but I know in in every other census, like ninety eight percent of Puerto Ricans check off white as right their up. race. Yeah. You know, and that's. That whole well, thing is a super whole other conversation. They, yeah. So we don't like to yes. talk about, we hadn't liked to talk about race. Mm-hmm. And I think we've had an awakening in the past number of years, especially with understanding that the divisions that have been sowed between black and Latino have been very purposeful on the point, on, the, on behalf of the people that wanted us not to see our commonalities so that we wouldn't unite together right. as a, as a, you know, a multicultural majority. And so what we've seen over the past number of years is kind of this new awareness of Afro-Latino identities and the alignment of Latino issues with the issues of other people of color and all this, which I think is fabulous from a social, political, you know, economic perspective and really important. But it also it also does create this interesting dynamic for white Latinos. Where do we fit in? in this new sort of view of the world, it's all a a work in progress. And I think a really interesting, you know, from an anthropological perspective, a really interesting turn of events that I'm actually excited to be a part of and living at this time. And, you know, like I have a daughter, nacida aquí in in Nueva York, rubia con ojos verdes, okay? Pero ella habla español y se identifica como puertorriqueña y como latina. And she doesn't question her identity because she, you know, young people today understand that identity is really what you make of it. You know what you what you are aligned with in the communities that that you know that you feel comfortable in and all this kind of stuff. And I think, well, I did a study recently that came out in the press with the people from See Her Short Flex. Yeah, (laughs) and it was a Gen Z study, and and (laughs) one of the big findings was that the Gen Z really feel that identity is something that they should be able. Your identity is something that you should be able to define, not that something that society should define for you. Yeah, so. I think that, and we've spoken about this identity crisis concept, and I know, Adriana, you had a different perspective. This and so is did you, the Jack. Identity. Exactly. This is the crisis because the different generations are all experiencing a different facet yes. of this, right? And so it's very difficult yeah. for us to mobilize around this concept because we're all experiencing it very differently, depending yeah. on when you were introduced to America, where you were born. The family you came from, socioeconomics, your race, your race color, uh-huh. what you've been exposed to, mm-hmm. all the things. And so there's so many Latinos who are feeling 
like it is not a competitive advantage to be Latino right mm. now because they still have the preconditioning of I need to fit in. I need to put mm. my hair in a bun. I can't rock my curls. I can't talk Spanish at the office. Oh, we get to bring our dishes. I can't bring arroz con andules. I got to bring <laughs> like, you know, vanilla cake or something <laughs> like that. Right. And so what do we do about this? Because mm -hmm. it's like it's so beautiful that we're evolving as a community. But at the same time, because of the complexities that exist within the community and just American society and those type of influences on us when we are trying to hold on to our cultura, but still be American and fit into America and all these things. How do we get more comfortable oh. in our own skin? So. I think that there's two ways. One, it is bringing whatever you want to mm -hmm. eat at work. It is bringing your true self. It is having the identity. This is who I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to understand it, accept it, and I'm going to own it. I'm going to mm -hmm. be it. But also doing it in a way that we're united because that's where we mobilize. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. You were talking about never feeling enough. When we, I was at Telemundo, we branded the network. And we did a lot of research and a lot of understanding. We found that when you have a network that's broadcasting, you reach many different types of people. How do you speak to just one or the other? Right. So we tried to find the human truths. And so we took that weakness of never feeling enough and turned it into a positive. And we said, we're 200 percenters. That's I actually right. coined that. Mm -hmm. It was 100 percent American, 100 percent Hispanic. And I'm going to bring the, and the actual logo of Telemundo is two pieces that come together and it turns into a T. But it was everything that we did. So if we were going to have the voice on NBC, we're going to have La Voz on mm -hmm. Telemundo. Mm -hmm. If we were going to, whatever we were going to do, we were going to do it, but we were going to do it our way. Mm -hmm. We were going to do it celebrating our language, our culture, our people, our mm -hmm. food, and our differences. Mm -hmm. But instead of pitting against each other, mobilizing yeah. and coming together and activating these are numbers 2.5 trillion but but activate those numbers mm -hmm. show the power that we have together as an ethnicity made, made up of different countries of origin different colors races, races yeah. whatever Religion. it might be mm -hmm. but the power that unites us is huge and it's culture mm -hmm. yeah. why mm -hmm. do you think hispanics have such a big influence on pop culture right right Right. So first of all, another flex. I mean, Telemundo, mm -hmm. icon, logo, mm -hmm. creator, all the things. Just want to put it out there. <laughs> so this brings me to our Talk That Talk segment, which is going to, I think, raise another concern that I have in the community that I feel is creating isolation mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> instead of connecting us. And it has to do with labels. It has to do with... Do I talk about the community as Latinx? Are they Hispanic? Are they Latino? Are they Latine? I remember I had a client who called me the biggest asset manager on the firm. I'm not going to say their name. The biggest asset manager in the world. And she was like, Victoria, I'm having a hard time. I'm like, okay. She's like, how do I describe your community? We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Ooh, this is really good. You should know about this. So I don't know about you, but I've been known to procrastinate. It's Especially when things scare the hell out of me. The fear alone would have me stuck, overwhelmed, confused, and all types of self-doubt. And don't even get me started on the imposter syndrome. Okay. okay. After getting laid off, not once, but three times, honey. Ew. I realized that the security blanket that I made up in my head was just an excuse because I didn't really want to bet on myself. The corporate benefits that had me in that headlock, girl, huh, they went out the window once my job decided that they no longer needed me. Turns out that I'll save a whole nickel if I cut your salary completely. The truth is, the only security blanket guarantee is the one that you create for yourself. In other words, until you start a business, you will always be at the mercy of a company's headcount and you will never have complete control over your time, which means you'll be renting out your thought leadership and helping build someone else's dream instead of your own. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Don't you think it's time you stop playing small and tap all the way into your power sis? Check out www.victoriagen.com slash training to learn my three-step process, the exact three steps that I took to make the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship. And this is helpful even if you don't know what type of business to start and have only one source of income. And this is absolutely free. It is my gift to you. I want you to win. It's winning season. In fact, what's that? It smells like winning season. Okay, so tap in and I'll see you inside the training. Let's go. 
Like I have this network here and they're trying to think of a name for themselves and we're trying to put out data. Like, do I say Latinx? Do I say Latinx? Do I say Hispanic? And what was so interesting is I didn't have an answer for her. No, I have an answer. <laughs> because it's like, I don't know. We all use the term. And I guess it, de it depends on what age group you're speaking to maybe, but collectively, how are we able to harmonize around each other if within the community itself, we have a disassociation and a disconnect with just how we talk about each other? So I have a really big opinion about this, mm -hmm. okay? In fact, I've been trying to sit down and find the time to write an article about it for a very long time. And I feel that the first thing that everybody has to understand is there's the conversation about language there's the conversation about identity, and then there's the conversation about marketing, right? Let's put the marketing over here, okay? What is the reason that we are talking about Latinx, Latine, all of that? It's not one word that we're talking about. It's actually a conversation about the Spanish language inherently being patriarchal and very bin uh, gender binary, okay? So when you think about the broader concept of conversations in this world around gender and around patriarchy and around women's rights. And you contextualize the conversation about languages that are gender binary within that framework. And then you start doing some research and you learn that it's not, this, this is, Latinx was not invented by marketers. Latinx was invented by activists, intellectuals, and young people in many Latin American countries, I think Argentina being the first, mm -hmm. okay? So it's not a marketing question. It is a language question and a question around equal rights. When So it's it, people who really, really understand this, don't just say Latinx or Latine, which, you know, we can talk about the, that in a second, but they'll say amigues. They'll say, like the word corillo, which means corillo, like you're, yeah. okay? But they'll say... Eh, Korea, you know, things like that, because they will, the goal is to take away the patriarchal and the non-gender neutral essence of the language. And by the way, it's not just Spanish. There are vi movements like this with other languages that are also gendered, mm. you know, so people that people don't know that because we only focus on this one word within the scope of this whole conversation. So then that takes me to the identity thing. So you're right, right? The word Hispanic, you know, we've been using it for 50 years, it's right? It's a marketing term, though. And it was first created, it was actually first created to unite the, these very disparate groups of Latinos who are Mexican, Puerto Rican, whatever, under, for political reasons, to be able to create a, like a voting pack that was one, you know, whatever. Mm. So we used the, so we came up with Hispanic, and this is now 50 years ago or something like that, like in the 70s. Then, then, you know, whatever, Latino came up, whatever, for other reasons. And there's could be debate about the meaning between Hispanic and Latino, whatever. And then we've got, you know, people saying now, well, but Latino's not, Latinx is not taking off or Latina is not taking off. How many freaking decades did it take for us to adopt Hispanic as a term, mm. right? It takes time for language to evolve, but language will always evolve. So... And by the way, in our research, we track whether or not people identify with the term. And what we're seeing, especially among young people, is that over the years, more and more people have said that, it, that Latinx or Latine is, a ter is the term that they either most identify with or is a term that they are okay. You know, it may not be the one they most identify with, but is one that they are comfortable with. And that number has grown steadily year over year. Mm. And I think it goes hand in hand with that other conversation about awareness around gender equality issues, around, you know, issues around gender neutral language and issues around women's empowerment. What are your thoughts? Because I, you come from like the corporate side. Yeah. And I think that's, it's like an interesting dynamic because I hear the research full through, but from the corporate side, when, when you're you trying to develop these programs and you're trying to build a business case and create community within your hallways, yeah. How do you do that when there's so much complexity? Yeah. So uh, sometimes when I hear that question, I say, don't let that get in your way. Like, 
it's a label and, and it's evolving because of all these reasons that you gave. But sometimes people use it as a reason not to lean in or it's too confusing. I don't understand it. It's not confusing. Um, first of all, I think people identify with you identify with being Puerto Rican. Like it's more your personal background. The reason to group people together is for either a marketing term or because you want to communicate with them. But what is your message? And how are you pulling them in with that human truth instead of the label? Like whether or not to market to Hispanics or Latinos or Latinx or Latin, because you don't know which term to use is kind of a scapegoat, right? Um, And so I think it's, you know, it's been evolving. But if you look at every community, labels have evolved. The difference is that in other communities, they've evolved and you can't you don't use them anymore. Like that's taboo. We kind of have them all. Right. (laughs) And that's where it gets a little bit confusing. But I think it's like just if you are going to do something for this community and you call them any of those things and what you're doing is really good and valuable and fun Mm -hmm. and they love it, they're never none of those are like bad. Mm -hmm. Right. They're all acceptable at the moment. Some might become unacceptable tomorrow. But right now, any of them, let's talk about what you want to say instead of what you're labeling them. And I also think that there's a certain, to your point, I think there is a certain generational thinking that can go into it, right? If you are targeting, you know, young Gen Z, you're going to use Latinx or Latina. Why? (laughs) <laughs> my data will tell you that you should, but not only that, it's because of all the other things I just said, right? They are much more aware of all of these issues around sexuality and gender identity and all these things. And that stuff matters more to those young people. Mm-hmm. Whereas you might talk to, you know, like a 65 year old, you know, very conservative, you know, traditional Hispanic man who is going to reject that terminology because not only does he not, you know, understand it, but even the basic concepts behind it are not things that he would but be. So let, let me say this. If you're a brand, to pick your favorite yeah. brand, and you're going to donate $100 million to planet Earth on behalf of Latinos or Hispanos or Latinx, you're, if you're a consumer, right. you're going to be like, yes. Exactly. Right? So it's like, yeah, I, it is confusing. And it will probably narrow itself down. But at the end of the day, you use any of them, it's not wrong. Not, you're not going to get put in the corner. It's more what are you doing and how does it matter? Yeah. Mm. So you don't think folks should keep in mind what generation they're talking to? I do think that they should keep in mind. But I also think that even if you're speaking to a younger generation and you said, Unidos Hispanos para el mundo. But I, it, it's, if the message is so powerful, right. I don't think a Gen Z is going to be like, oh, they used the wrong word. Yeah. Because like other communities, that words have been evolved and become taboo that were not there yet. So I don't think it's something people should like be so fearful that they can't put their foot in the water and do what they need to do. Totally. Yeah. And I will also add that any marketer or brand who's concerned, who's worried more about the terminology than about what you how you're going to execute because you got to use a little bit more creativity in your marketing if all you think about is you the know label. what label to Jackie's point about the ad and making ads you know resonate the ads aren't going to resonate just because you put a big latino or latinx or hispanic word across it mm. it's not about the word it's what is the creative what is the messaging what is the that that story, that hook that's gonna that's gonna connect with people, and it has nothing to do with the label. It has to do with the story behind the creative, and ultimately the authenticity. The behind authenticity, the exactly. Which I think is a great way for us to end today's show. Thank oh, you, ladies, wow. so much Thank for joining. You. I feel like we obviously could talk about this for hours, and yep. maybe we'll bring you guys back because between the both of you, there's just so much knowledge and information and research side versus corporate side I just think there's so many yeah. dynamics and different ways we can pull from that but thank you for sharing your oh, thoughts so leadership much today thank you for having us and yeah. for your magic uh, thank you guys for tuning in and I'll see you on the next episode
Hola, mi gente. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Don't forget to make sure and leave a review. This is super important because this is how we're measured on the different audio platforms. So if you want to hear more of Banking on Cultura, if you were vibing, if you had takeaways, if you just enjoyed this episode, please make sure to leave a review. I appreciate you so much. Until next time.